The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome everyone to the IIVS sponsored webinar on in vitro phototoxicity assays. This webinar is provided as part of IIVS's educational webinar series and is funded through contributions to the Institute. Today's webinar will cover practical experiences and current perspectives on the use of the in vitro 3P3 infrared uptake phototoxicity assay, which is OECD test guideline 432, and the use of reconstructed human epidermis models for phototoxicity testing. We will provide a general overview of the use of the assay and we'll discuss some recent information and publications. We'll close the webinar with approximately 15 minutes of question and answer time. Before we start, let's take a moment to ensure that everyone is ready and familiar with the webinar control panel. Due to the large number of attendees, all audio other than the panelists has been muted and will remain so for the duration of the webinar. You may ask questions by using the question feature at the bottom of the control panel to the right. Click on the arrow to maximize the control panel and view the questions window. Technical questions can be submitted anytime, but will be held until the end of the presentation. We are recording this webinar and the question and answer session at the end. Any questions that are not able to be answered within the scheduled webinar time will receive a written response that will be distributed to all webinar participants along with a PDF of the presented slides and a link to view the webinar recording within about a week. Let's meet our speakers. Today's presenter from IIVS is Ms. Allison Hilber. She is a study director for phototoxicity assays and has been working with the assay since she joined IIVS about eight years ago. Allison has presented the assay many times during IIVS hands-on training workshops, both in the U.S. and internationally. We are very pleased to have Dr. Manfred Leach with us today as our guest speaker. Dr. Leach received his PhD in biology from the University of Hamburg and took a position as the head of the pharmacodynamics unit at the Laboratory of Pharmacology and Toxicology, which is a CRO. From there, he moved to ZBET, the alternative method to animal experiments at the Federal Institute for Risk Assessment, where he rose to the position of scientific director and head of unit in November of oh, in, in November of last year, Manfred retired from ZBEST. So we're very grateful to him for his participation today. I will now pass control to Allison, who will begin with an overview of in vitro phototoxicity. Thank you, Mandy. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on phototoxicity. We're going to start our webinar with an overview of the 3T3 Nutrared uptake phototoxicity and the three-dimensional reconstructed human epidermis in vitro assays. We'll start the webinar with a brief outline of these assays, highlighting their application and use, procedures, and data analyses. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time discussing specific details, as these assays have been around for a number of years and many of you may already be familiar with them. However, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar to address specific questions you may have. Today we're going to spend some time talking about practical experiences using these assays, specifically solubility and tear testing approaches. These are some of the common discussion points for those who are working with these assays or have used them to assess photo safety. And finally, Dr. Manfred Leach, our guest speaker, will address current perspectives on photo safety testing, including those from a pharmaceutical perspective, UVB absorbers, and highlight some of the discussion points from the 2010 XBAM 3T3 phototoxicity workshop. Manfred has spent a number of years working on these assays from their development to validation, and his efforts have propelled these assays to the levels of understanding and acceptance they have reached today. We're very honored to have Dr. Leach participation with our webinar today. Thinking about photo safety testing, a reasonable start is in vitro assays. Why are they performed? How do they work? 
What assays do we have there available? Before you evaluate your test material in these assays, you want to take some initial steps to understand your material. Does it absorb in the wavelength of 290 to 700? Will it accumulate or distribute to sunlight exposed areas on the skin and eyes? Will it produce a more reactive species? If you answered yes to any of these questions, then you've likely looked into photo safety testing. There is common ground among considerations for testing. However, each regulatory body may have differing approaches or recommendations. So it's really important to understand those requirements as you move forward. Cosmetics and pharmaceuticals, for example, are very different types of products and may require different approaches and considerations. At IIVS, we use two assays to determine phototoxic potential, the 3T3 Nutrid uptake assay and the three-dimensional reconstructed human epidermis. These assays share similar approaches to assess phototoxic potential by making comparisons between cells or tissues exposed in the presence or absence of UVA and visible light. These assays can be used independently or as part of a tiered testing approach. As we move forward, we'll individually break down these assays a bit further, and then we'll uncover how these assays might be used together as a tiered testing approach. Again, with these photo safety assays, the idea is essentially the same. We want to compare the cells or tissues in the presence and absence of UVA and visible light. There are a number of considerations in how and when to use these assays, so let's take a look at some of these general comparisons. The 3T3 assay is a 96 well based monolayer assay utilizing the 3T3 mouse fibroblast, whereas the three-dimensional assay is a reconstructed human epidermis tissue model with a number of cell layers, including a functional stratum corneum. Now, this is important because the function stratum corneum mimics the human epidermis with a barrier function. As you can see from the photos, the micrograph of the 3T3 confluent monolayer in the 96 well plate to the left and then also the histological sectioning of the layers of the three-dimensional tissue provided by Matt Tech to the right. Again, notice that top layer with the function stratum corneum. In terms of applications, the 3T3 assay is a bit more limited with the types of materials we can assess. Typically, ingredients, botanicals, and antibiotics are good candidates for this assay system. We'll treat the cells with at least eight concentrations of the test material up to the highest concentration of 1,000 micrograms per mil. The three-dimensional assay provides a bit more versatility in the types of test materials we can evaluate. Like the 3T3 assay, we can look into ingredients, but this assay also offers us the freedom to test materials that are insoluble and also final formulations. As our standard practice at IIVS, test materials are topically applied Although systemic approaches where a test material is treated into the culture medium has also, also been evaluated. Viability will be assessed using the Nutrared uptake endpoint for the 3T3 and the MTT endpoint for the three-dimensional model. The 3T3 Nutrared uptake assay went through a formal validation process in the late 90s with 30 test chemicals. Its demonstrated predictivity and usefulness propelled it to an OECD test guideline in 2004. The OECD test guideline makes this assay quite appealing for use, especially when a regulatory accepted assay is preferred. The three-dimensional assay, although it went through an initial pre-validation in the late 90s, showed great promise, but a formal validation has not yet been conducted. So we have these two assays for photo safety assessment. How, how do we you know, know where to start? So there's different approaches that we may need to consider in terms of hazard assessment and risk assessment. The 3T3 assay is generally recommended as a first tier approach, depending on the regulatory agency. A negative result in the 3T3 assay may not require additional photo safety testing, and again, this depends on the regulatory agency. In cases where additional information is needed, for example, if we were to get a positive 3T3 result, or perhaps we're looking from a hazard assessment perspective of an ingredient moving into a risk assessment of a final formulation, the three-dimensional assay could serve as a second tier. I'll focus a bit more on these tier testing approaches when we move into our practical experiences. I wanted to give you a little bit of background on how we actually use the Nutred uptake endpoint. 
this is what's used to assess viability for the 3T3 assay. So the cartoon on your right highlights the mechanisms involved here. Neutral red is an uncharged dye and passively crosses the cell and lysosomal membrane. The lysosomes with an acidic pH transfer charge to the neutral red dye. Once the neutral red becomes charged, it becomes trapped in the lysosome. Cells which are viable and have intact membranes will be able to retain the neutral red dye, and those cells which are dead or have membrane integrity issues will not be able to retain the dye. You can see from the microphotographs below that the 3T3 is before the addition of neutral red, and then the 3T3 is after the addition of neutral red. Note the accumulation of the dye intracellularly within the cell lysosome. Now let's take a look at the general overview of the 3T3 assay. Again, I'm not going to focus on the step-by-step -step specifics, but if you would like more information, I encourage you to ask your questions as we proceed, and then we can address them during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. This assay starts with seeding of 96 well plates. Each test material will receive two plates one for the assessment of the presence of UVA in visible light and one in the absence of UVA in visible light. Each assay also includes a positive control chlorpromazine tested concurrently in two plates. After the cells have been seeded, they're grown at standard culture conditions for approximately 24 hours. This allows the cells to obtain a confluency of approximately 50%. On the day of dosing, each plate is evaluated for proper distribution, morphology, and confluency, and then labeled with a test or control material. The cells are rinsed to remove media containing phenol red, which could potentially interfere with our light exposure, and then a buffered solution is added to the plate. A serial dilution of at least eight doses and again, this is really going to depend on phototoxicity potential, is prepared for each test or control material. The cells are treated in six replicate wells with a test or control material for one hour, followed by a 50-minute exposure in the absence or presence of UVA visible light, for a total exposure of five joules per centimeter squared. The plates are then rinsed, and the cells incubated for a 24-hour post-exposure expression period where we may see enhancement of toxicity or perhaps even a repair effect of the cells. Nutra dye is then added to the cell cultures for three hours, and then the cells are lysed with a Nutra solvent. The plates are shaken and then read on a plate spectrophotometer. Now as we move into the 3T3 data assessment, we're going to use two measures to assess our phototoxic potential. The PIF or photoirritancy factor and the mean photo effect or MPE. Now we have a special program provided by ZVET called Phototox 2.0 that we're able to use to assess these two values. In general, the PIF is going to compare the IC50 of the dark plate to the IC50 of the light plate. Now this can be difficult to use, especially where there's a case where you have one IC50 or both IC50s that may not be obtained. So then the mean photo effect comes into play. The MPE is going to evaluate the curve responses between the light and the dark plates. And this is especially useful when we don't have an IC50 for one, of one or both plates. At the bottom of the page, you'll see the OECD test guideline predictions in terms of our measures of phototoxic potential as being no phototoxicity, probable phototoxicity, or phototoxicity. And again, we have different parameters for the PIF and the MPE value. Digging in a little bit deeper with the PIF, here's some examples of exactly how this is going to be calculated. So we have our graphics here on the right, which would represent two different plates or two different response curves in the presence and absence of light. We have our concentration as well as our viability. And then the dose response curve, each box here represents one of the six replicate wells. So our IC50 of our light plate is 0.73 micrograms per mil. And then our dark plate is 15.4 micrograms per mil. If we take the IC50 of the dark plate divided by the IC50 of the light plate, we come up with a PIF value of 21.1 for this particular example. 
looking next into our OECD prediction, you can see that this particular test material does have phototoxic potential as the PIF value is greater than 5. Now the MPE is a little bit more challenging as it's going to look at the dose response curve of the light and the dark plate. Now previously we were looking at individual plate data and here we're taking both plate data and putting it together on a single graphic. So this represents our UVA response curve and this would represent our dark response curve. The area in green here represents our mean photo effect. So essentially if you want to think about it, in theory if you were to have 100% viability all the way across your dark plate and 0% viability across your entire light plate, your MPE value would be approximately 1. Now on the right here, you'll notice there really isn't much separation between the two curves. This is because this isn't exhibiting a phototoxic potential. The MPE for this particular example is 0 0.001, close to 0, and then the MPE of the graphic on your left is 0.567. Again, if we move down to our prediction model, we could see that on the left, this test article would be phototoxic, and on the right, it would be not phototoxic. The example on the left here is actually chlorpromazine, which is our positive control for the assay. Now moving away from the 3C3 monolayer and into the three-dimensional tissue model, here are some brief overview procedures. So we're going to treat the tissues for up to 24 hours. Um, that allows for penetration of the test article into the cells. And then after that 24-hour period, we'll remove the test material. This will ensure that we don't have any potential interference with the light. And then finally, we will do our UVA or dark exposures for 60 minutes for a total of 6 joules per centimeter squared for the cells exposed in the presence of UVA. Like the 3T3 assay, we'll have that post-expression period followed by an MCT incubation. Now, MCT is going to measure the metabolic activity of the cells, and we'll have a yellow uh, colored MCT, which is eventually going to be transferred to a purple color by viable cells. At the end of our MCT incubation period, we'll then extract an isopropanol and finally determine our optical density values using a plate spectrophotometer. In terms of our phototoxic potential assessment for this assay, we're going to, again, look at the, the tissues exposed in the presence and absence of light. And if we see a 30% decrease in the cells exposed in the presence of light compared to those exposed in the dark, will then say that that test material has phototoxic potential. So if we look at this data set here, we have a test article with a optical density value of 1.12 exposed in the presence of light and 1.3 exposed in the absence of UVA light. In terms of percent of control, we have 82%, 96%, so only about a 14, 15% difference. Based on this, this would not be exhibiting a phototoxic response. On the other hand, if we look at chlorpromazine, we can see our percent of control viability. There's about a 50% difference between the tissues exposed in the presence and the absence of light. So this particular example would definitely be a phototoxic material. And here at the bottom of the page, you can see tissues exposed in the absence of light which you see the MTT purple coloration, which may be very similar to our controls. And then over to the right here, we have tissues exposed in the presence of UVA that have a viability reduction, perhaps maybe around 40%. So in this particular example, this test article would have also exhibited a phototoxic effect. Now moving into practical experiences, uh, we want to talk about some of the things that we routinely encounter and also discuss how we can use these assays as part of a tiered testing strategy. 
Solubility assessment is extremely important for a 3T3 assay and not that big of a hurdle for the three-dimensional assay since we can test insolubles. So we want to make sure that we're able to have a test article dilution that we can work with in our monolayer cultures. We're going to perform our solubility assessment prior to the assay conduct. And we have a number of different solvents that we can use. We'll start out typically with HBSS followed by DMSO, ethanol, and acetone. There may be some cases where you have a test material that would be dissolved in something other than one of these mentioned. However, it's important that if we do proceed with that, that we also assess the phototoxic potential of that particular solvent. The key here is we want to avoid precipitate when possible. Um, heating and sonication are some of the standard measures that we do to further solubilize our test materials. And also, selecting the most appropriate solvent can also help with your solubility. Now, we have seen that homogenous suspensions can be tested, and they also do exhibit appropriate responses. The key word here is bioavailability. We have to make sure that our cells um, are available to interact with that test material. So you can see on the right here, we have a graphic representing our test material dissolved in DMSO first and then transferred to HBSS. You can see how the test article has precipitated out upon transfer. It's important that things like that are assessed prior to moving forward. We deal with a number of different types of materials in 3T3 assay. And some of these responses here are things that we might typically see. We really have to step back and evaluate what we can move forward with, with and what we really need to determine perhaps that we can't proceed. So starting here on the left, we have a biphasic material. You can see the test material floating on top. Um, this would definitely not be a test material that you'd want to work with for the 3T3 phototox assay because you really can't be assured that if your cells are at the bottom here, that they would be able to interact with your test material. Another example would be we have floating particles. Um, how much of that is actually in solution, if any? Then we may have some test article adhering to our dilution tube. In some cases, we'll get a homogeneous suspension or solution. And typically, those two types of dilutions are ones that we've found we're able to work with. Homogeneous suspensions have been shown to produce cytotoxic effects and have shown ability to determine phototoxic potential. And ideally, the best case scenario would be our solution. So what do we do when we have an insoluble test material? I like to call this the solution to the suspension. So the first step is going with our solubility assessment. Can we work with this test material? Is it homogenous? If it's completely insoluble, like, for example, the biphasic material, we may decide to go all the way to the end point here to address other platforms, for example, the reconstructed human epidermis. But in general, if we're able to get somewhat of a homogenous suspension, we may proceed with the dose range finding assay and evaluate those results. If we do see some evidence of bioavailability, by perhaps some level of cytotoxicity, we may then proceed with the definitive assays. However, in some cases, we have to start thinking about bioavailability. Is the test material bioavailable? If we see a viability of 100% across the board, is that absence of cytotoxicity truly an absence of cytotoxicity, or is it because the test material hasn't been able to interact with the cells? So we may determine that the test article is incompatible with the test system and finally move into our reconstructed human epidermis model. So here are a couple examples of what data could look like in a case where solubility affected our final results. So in the example here, we have curve upswings. So you can see as we start increasing our concentrations of test material, we start to see a drop, and then finally the spike at the end of our dose response curve. That perhaps is due to residual precipitates interfering with our neutral red, or maybe even um, 
making the uh, optical density readings, um, the media a bit cloudy. The other example here is perhaps maybe one of the worst case scenarios. So you can see after the plate's been exposed to the neutral in the cell's life, you can see the variations in the neutral uptake throughout the entire plate. And you might get data that looks something like this. So you can actually plug it into your Phototox software and get some numbers. But again, in looking at this data, this is too noisy, and you would not want to proceed with this particular test material in the 3T3 assay. So let's assume that we did get those results from the previous slide. How do we move forward from the three-dimensional into the three-dimensional assay? So the important consideration here is will the tissue tolerate the test article for up to 24 hours, followed by that 21-hour post-expression period? Again, there are multiple ways to look at the reconstructed human epidermis, but we'll stick with the idea that we're working with a single formulation here and want to move forward with perhaps the 24-hour test article exposure. So what we routinely do here at IIVS is we'll recommend a time to toxicity prescreening. This will give us some information about um, the toxicity response for that particular test article. So here we have our exposure time and a percent of control. So we'll look at perhaps three to four different concentrations. And based on the information, determine what would be the most appropriate exposure time to work with for the three-dimensional assay. So in this case, if we were to go with a 24-hour exposure, you can see that our mean percent survival for the test article exposed in the presence of light would be about 2%, and that in the absence of light is about 18%. If we look on the prediction model of 30%, we would say that this would not exhibit a phototoxic response. However, the test material is too toxic, and we need better resolution. So if we bring it out and look at the 8-hour exposure, we have a 50% viability exposed in the presence of UVA, and about 85% in the absence of UVA. So now we can correctly identify this as a phototoxic potential. So now we've seen the three-dimensional, how it could be used as an alternate. Let's think about how we can use these as a tier testing approach. Ideally, the 3T3 assay could serve as the first tier with a three-dimensional assay as the second tier. From the 3T3 to the 3D assay, the results could give you insight from a hazard assessment to a risk assessment. This approach could be used to model end user experience when using final formulations, for example. Although negative results in the 3T3 assay may not require additional testing, perhaps you'd want to evaluate the ingredient in its final formulation to confirm the 3T3 results. Manfred's later going to talk a little bit about materials which are overpredicted in the 3T3 assay. So the three-dimensional assay could serve as that second tier to confirm the positive result or even rule out an overprediction. Here's a specific example of a tier testing approach using the 3D and 3T3 assays. This was recently published early this year. And it took a look at some common UV filters, like avobenzene, octyl salicylate, and octocrylene, and also vitamin A. And we looked at um, both the 3T3 and the three-dimensional assays. So the compounds initially were evaluated for phototoxicity using individual chemicals in the 3T3 assay. Avobenzene was detected as phototoxic for OECD test guideline 432. And also, vitamin A did show some potential for phototoxicity in two of four independent trials. A number of those UV filters and vitamin A combinations were then assessed in the 3T3 assay. Those results showed a synergistic effect in levels of enhancement of phototoxicity depending on the combinations used, specifically those combinations that were containing avobenzene. So the next step was to evaluate those same combinations in a three-dimensional model. In the three-dimensional model, for example, we saw that the same effect wasn't seen up to 10% in one of the combinations. So when thinking about this, the combinations may have only represented a portion of those presented in the paper. But generally, 
These combinations were three UV filters with or without UVA. So you can see here the 3T3 results. Here's our PIP values and our MPE. And these are varying levels of the filters with or without the UVA, or I'm sorry, with or without the uh, vitamin A. And you can see some of these were phototoxic responses or probable phototoxic responses. Then moving in the reconstructed epidermis model, we have our concentrations up to 10% here, and our MTT as a percent of control. which was phototoxic in the 3T3, was not phototoxic in any of the concentrations in the reconstructed human epidermis model. Another tiered approach, which was presented at SOT this year, was a collaborative effort between IIVS and Avon products. And they wanted to, I guess, point out how they're using the in vitro results for product development. So this figure represents their testing strategy for evaluation of ingredients. So the first step is to determine if the material absorbs light. If it did, the first tier was the 3T3 phototoxicity assay. Any positive results in that assay would mean that the ingredient would no longer be used or assessed for potential use as part of a cosmetic. If it was negative in the 3T3 assay, it then went into a confirmatory clinical phototoxicity assay. If there was potential to be phototoxic in the clinical, also it would stop. However, if it was non-phototoxic in the clinical, the material was determined to be non-phototoxic. We looked at 68 different ingredients, and um, of those, a number were phototoxic or probable phototoxic, and many more were non-phototoxic. Here's a couple pictures of some of the botanicals that actually showed um, phototoxic potential. And here's a table, or I should say a portion of the table that was used. You can see here that some of the botanical blends or botanicals that were used the 3T3 in vitro scores based on the PIF and MPE, and finally a conclusion of either not phototoxic or phototoxic. Nine, excuse me, eight of those chemicals then proceeded to the clinical setting, and the clinical setting also confirmed the results of the 3T3 assay as non-phototoxic. At this point, I'd like to pass this over to Manfred to discuss photo safety testing perspectives and discussions of the XVAM workshop held in 2010. Manfred? Okay. Thank you, Alison, and um, uh, um, hello to everyone, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk a bit about the regulatory perspectives now. Um, um, I, for being uh, with you, I missed the talk of uh, your president, who is currently in Berlin, giving a talk at the Brandenburg Gate. Uh, it is his first visit uh, of Germany uh, uh, since he became president. And uh, but my wife will listen, and the internet gives me the opportunity to uh, uh, to uh, know what happened also this evening. Okay, so I will talk a bit about the concerns of pharmaceutical industry, and that is a bit different to um, cosmetic industry, where the uh, two-tiered approach that Alison has just uh, mentioned uh, nicely <coughs> is almost established in most uh, companies that <coughs> are using ingredients that may be uh, phototoxic or contaminated with phototoxins uh, due to their botanical origin. In pharmaceutical industry, uh, each new uh, chemical that, uh, or each new drug uh, candidate substance that absorbs significantly uh, has to be tested uh, for phototoxicity, and the concerns were that uh, too many uh, materials were turned out to be positive in a 3T3, and we had an FPR uh, survey in 2010 that FPR is the uh, European Association for uh, of the pharmaceutical uh, industry, um, uh, and I will show this um, outcome of this survey. And as a way forward, we had in 2010 
a workshop uh, from organized, co-organized from FBI, FBI and ECWAM uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, the outcome of this workshop was published and it's now uh, taken up first by uh, the European regulators for, for pharmaceuticals, that is the EMA, European uh, uh, Agency for Medic Medicinal Products. Uh, they published it as a question and answer paper in 2011 on their website because uh, it is now um, usual that uh, we don't have uh, special European regulations. We just uh, um, uh, get this um, harmonized at the ICH level, that is the International Conference for Harmoni Harmonization. And they um, uh, generated a new guideline uh, called S10 on photo safety testing. This is currently in step three of the, uh, um, uh, of the whole procedure. That means uh, it has been consolidated by the uh, ICH uh, experts and is now in an open or has been in an open consul uh, consul um, consultation process, uh, which is uh, finished now and it should be published the final document uh, in 2013 in June. So that's very soon. Um, uh, I'll can, next slide, please. <coughs> next. Do you hear me? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So this is a, a bit more in detail. What were the concerns of pharmaceutical industry? Uh, they, the first concern was that uh, many drug substances absorb uh, UV um, in invisible rain uh, in uh, invisible light between two, uh, 290 and 700 nanometers with an uh, absorption which is called molar extinction coefficient of uh, larger than 10. Uh, and of these, uh, about 50% were then positive in the 3D3, triggering additional in vivo testing. Uh, the um, 3D3 was regarded obviously as too sensitive. And the approach was to desensitize the 3D3 assay by either increasing the threshold for phototoxicological testing, that means the absorption threshold, or by changing the prediction model, that means uh, setting up uh, the cutoffs that uh, Ellison has nicely shown, the PIF of 5 and the MPE of uh, 1.0.15, uh, and uh, probably by reducing the maximum test concentration. So the first response of the competent authorities, uh, the European uh, um, uh, Agency for Medicinal Products, uh, EMA was, your concerns may be correct. However, since negative results in the 3D3 are valid for waiving the need of any further phototoxicological testing, and that is complicated tests like photoallergy, uh, that you only can test in vivo, photogenotoxicity, where we have totally oversensitive uh, uh, in vitro assays, and photocarcinogenicity where we have several uh, models that are very complicated and not very predictive. So uh, um, the reduction of the oversensitivity should be limited to still keep uh, a level of 100% sensitivity because only if you, if you have no false negatives, then you can say you are done with the 3D3 assay if you get a negative result. That is a very important point. Next. Next. Okay, thanks. Um, the concerns of FPR uh, uh, <coughs> were published in uh, 2011. Um, and um, I have summarized here the main points uh, of this publication. Uh, Ten uh, European FPR members participated in this survey. 361 drugs, uh, drug substances were analyzed that had been uh, tested, uh, almost all of them in the 3D3. 97% uh, had, had been tested in the 3D3. 11% uh, had been tested also in vivo in animals and 1%, that means five substances or drug substances, had been tested also in humans in clinical studies. Next, please. Thanks. So uh, these are graphs uh, from this publication. 
and the basis of the concerns uh, you see on the left side was the percentage uh, of positive results in the 3-3. Uh, the 361 is the, the pie chart uh, uh, on the left top. Uh, the green uh, part is uh, the negative uh, 3D3 assays, the red part is the positive ones, and the yellow part is the uh, equivocal part, that is the probable phototoxicity in the range between 2 and, uh, and 5 regarding the PIF, and uh, 0.12 and 0.15 regarding the MPE. On the top right, uh, you see uh, the distribution of positive, uh, respectively equivocal uh, positive uh, results uh, 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 over companies or across companies and you see that um, uh, some companies have really high percentages like over 60 percent and some companies have uh, considerably low like 20 percent um, uh, and in, in, on average it was something like 50 percent. On the bottom left picture, you see uh, those chemicals that were either negative or positive, tested uh, or equivocal, tested in vivo, in vivo models. And I have to emphasize these in vivo models are all not, let's say, fully validated. There, there's a lot of different in vivo models. I'm not talking about them. I've done them in the CRO uh, 30 years ago, but <laughs> um, uh, the my opinion is uh, that they are uh, not all really well developed and not validated and that's why the OECD stopped the whole in vivo uh, uh, um, approach in, in 1991. What you see on the bottom is that the of the um, uh, positives uh, of the pie chart, uh, 26 were tested uh, and only uh, 4 were positive and the rest was negative. So, uh, and, and you see the negatives, they were all turned out also negative in vivo. That means uh, the 100% sensitivity is uh, okay. There's no false negatives, but uh, obviously a high percentage of false positives. My first criticism is uh, why, if they have 50% positives, why don't they have uh, something like um, uh, shown uh, in vivo data of 50% uh, of 361 chemicals tested in total. So <laughs> that is a bit um, a weakness of this study. On the right hand you see uh, of the positives um, uh, in vivo uh, in, in, in the 3D3, the clinical data were five uh, materials were tested, all negative. Next please. So uh, this is um, uh, uh, also from the uh, FPR survey, a distribution of the PIF values uh, uh, across uh, all uh, um, uh, tests, all 361 tests, and you see that the distribution is quite different. Uh, we had uh, in this graph uh, shown uh, uh, one company diff, uh, um, uh, separately because they didn't participate in this uh, survey. Uh, and as you see in this one company, uh, there is a quite, um, let's say, nice distribution from uh, the majority being uh, at PIFs at around 10 and uh, a minority only with PIFs 1000. But if you see it across the rest of the companies, it's uh, an up and down and therefore uh, um, not really uh, showing a certain uh, picture where you could say, well, the PIF probably could be shifted, uh, the prediction model could be shifted to get um, uh, a bit more desensitization, uh, uh, to, to achieve a desensitization. My critics, and that is uh, something that I said at the, at the workshop, that is also in the workshop report and it is in the conclusions of the workshop report which I would um, uh, recommend to read, anyone who wants to know, uh, is that um, the survey only uh, looked for the PIF values but not at the concentrations at which these were reached because it is, uh, like Ellison said nicely, it is very uh, important that you check the bioavailability of your uh, substance in the skin. And if, uh, if you have a, a drug candidate, you will always have to do a biokinetics, pharmacokinetics where you know finally what is the concentration of my chemical in the skin? Does it accumulate in the skin? Does it stay in the skin? 
and uh, these values are absolutely necessary and, uh, uh, and, and unfortunately in the FPR survey FPR has forgotten to ask the companies uh, for these concentrations. So the concentration at which you get a positive PIF are much more relevant than the PIF value itself. The PIF value does not correlate with the potency of a phototoxin. That is something that we have already known in 2000 in the first ECMAM workshop and it is, it is if, if, if people read this workshop report, it is said there already there is no correlation between the PIF and the potency and therefore uh, uh, it is not easy just to say well uh, this is the distribution of the PIF, it would be nice to know at which concentrations these PIFs were obtained. Next please. Next, yeah, okay. <laughs> so, um, as Alison said already, absorption is a, is the relevant trigger, and uh, we uh, we have here the original text from the uh, OECD guideline. Alison also mentioned that um, I was heavily involved in the um, development, validation, and also regulatory acceptance of this essay. So uh, at that time, I was in Paris seconded as a German expert to the OECD and I worked on uh, four new alternative methods uh, and one of them was the 3D3 uh, phototox assay and uh, in the commenting round of this guideline uh, commenters uh, asked for um, give a specific value because we only said a significant absorption is always an indicator for uh, necessity to test phototoxicity. So uh, uh, I tried to find something and the only thing that I found was one guidance document on photostability where we had the cutoff of 10. So I sent this around the world and asked all the experts involved in validation and involved in the commenting, are you happy, uh, happy if, if we take this value in the guideline? And they said, well, we don't have anything else, so <laughs> take it. And that's uh, the reason why it was set to 10, but it was not part of the uh, results of the validation study. And, uh, and therefore, um, um, the critics may have been correct. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> next. Okay. <coughs> This is um, uh, one of the responses of industry on the question of whether uh, the, uh, I call it now MAC, molecular extinction coefficient, whether the MAC of 10 is a good cutoff, or a, a valid cutoff. And uh, it's a very nice uh, publication from Pfizer, from Henry, uh, Forti and Alsante. And um, this had two objectives, one to check the molecular extinction coefficient MAC um, compared to 3D3 results, uh, other in vivo results, and other in vitro results, and all knowledge about uh, phototoxicity in humans. Um, and the other uh, was uh, using data on photostability, that is the physical chemical stability when uh, a, a material is irradiated, whether well, this is a good trigger. Next, please. Next. Okay. Here you see uh, one figure for, from this uh, publication from Henry et al. And uh, these were uh, 35 well established uh, phototoxins. Uh, they have been tested according to what we have in the OCD test guideline um, uh, um, with an absorption spectrum uh, uh, and the molecular extinction coefficient determined according to OECD test guideline 101, that see, that's, uh, means that you, you determine at each peak of your absorption spectrum uh, the, um, the extinction in a one centimeter cuvette uh, in PBS at uh, buffered to 5.5 and 7.4, that is the range in, uh, that is expected in uh, physiological tissues. Um, uh, if you can't solve it uh, in PBS, you use uh, acetonitril, which has no absorption uh, uh, as a solvent. And uh, what you see on this uh, graph is, and what you have several points per chemical, <coughs> that except one point, all the determinations were 
um, uh, uh, between 1,000 and 10,000 and none in the area of 10. <coughs> this one point that is below 1,000 is one peak of uh, Antrazen, which uh, was determined at 290 uh, nanometers. So, uh, based on this, uh, the ECVAM workshop agreed on rising the, uh, the trigger to test with a 3T3 assay um, or to test with any bi photobiological assay only materials that absorb higher than 1,000 instead of 10, which is, which is uh, still in the OCD guideline. Next, please. Next. Okay. Uh, this is uh, just uh, the, uh, the cover uh, and title of our uh, workshop report, uh, which was published in Regulatory Toxicology and Pharmacology, uh, where FPR, uh, organized by ECVAM, met in, uh, in Italy with all the experts involved in the validation study, involved in the uh, um, uh, acceptance process. Next, please. Next. So, uh, <coughs> the objectives of the ECOM workshop were to discuss uh, improved triggers for phototoxicological testing. One was to uh, increase the, uh, the MEC threshold. Uh, the second one was inclusion of a second trigger, and that the second trigger is uh, the generation of reactive oxygen species, ROS. Uh, which was an, a, a new assay developed by uh, Japan, and the Japanese colleagues had already done <coughs> several interlaboratory uh, small-scale trials and were just planning in 2010 um, uh, a formal validation study, which uh, is now finished and currently peer-reviewed. The second uh, important point was discuss scientifically acceptable means to desensitize the 3D3 um, uh, essay by either modification of the t uh, uh, prediction model and uh, second probably by reduction of the maximum test concentration. Um, the third uh, objective was discuss the role of other in vitro assays, in particular human 3D skin models in phototoxicity uh, uh, testing. So next slide please. Next. Okay, thanks. <coughs> so, these are the main outcomes of the ECVAM workshop based on the uh, work of Pfizer. That is the Henry et al. Uh, publication that I just showed. The MEC was uh, shifted from 10 to 1,000. Fine. Based on the data that we were shown uh, for the photo ROS assay, um, the photo ROS assay was regarded uh, as um, 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 a promising second trigger in, in addition to the MEC, probably even uh, better than the MEC, because that was very interesting, although in theory ROS does not be generated by all uh, mechanisms of uh, phototoxicity that we exactly know. Um, uh, uh, it is obviously all, uh, with all mechanisms always some ROS is generated. and. Um, uh, therefore, uh, the Japanese were encouraged to uh, perform their formal validation study and to probably get this into the ICH uh, guidance. Uh, the gray zone that uh, Ellison showed, which is currently also in the OECD guideline, between a PIF of uh, 2 and 5 and between an MPE uh, of 1.2 and 1.5, uh, sorry, 0.12, sorry, this is a is a typo. It's 0.12, of course, and uh, 0.15. This may be obsolete, and um, uh, I'm telling already now that the ICH guidance document now says um, uh, um, you may regard this as negative. The reason is that there, uh, in the validation study, there was a plateau um, of um, the same uh, same classification level. Uh, with regard to sensitivity and specificity was reached in, in, in a plateau be between 2 and 5 with a PIF between 0.12 and 0.15. And the OECD commenters, which were often regulators, they said, well, why don't you take the most sensitive uh, thing as already probable? 
phototoxic. And then when you have uh, an increase in your uh, sensitivity above five, and uh, um, uh, then you take it as definitely phototoxic. So this probably phototoxic was, let's say, an agreement uh, zone. Um, but it was uh, it is it was not that important and uh, and people to desensitize now take it away. Uh, the highest test concentration of thousand may also be too high because what we know from another study that is uh, not discussed today that was also an, a validation study that we performed in uh, in 1988 and was published in 2000 in Atla is a UV filter study. From that study we know that the concentrations um, at 100 already uh, are sufficient, uh, but uh, um, uh, people regarded, uh, people requested that we analyze all the different validation phases together, which was more than uh, 70 chemicals tested in three phases. And we take the cutoff from there, and uh, and that showed that 1,000 is not uh, increasing the false positives compared to 100, so it was, uh, 1,000 was used for pharmaceuticals, it's obviously too much, uh, but before pharmaceutical industry doesn't show these, uh, the data, regulators would not accept to go below this uh, maximum testing concentration if it can be achieved. Uh, if you look at the ICH guidance, it says it can be lower if you show that your biokinetic data show that uh, the concentrations reached in the tissues are much, much lower. Then um, they would not request, even if, if it is doable, uh, these incredibly high concentrations. So in contrast to cosmetics, uh, where the exposure is always topical, the 3D skin uh, model uh, uh, may be of limited value as a second confirmatory tier test for systemic drugs. It may be. Uh, and, and, and if you read the ICH guidance as it is now, it says for uh, dermatopical uh, or dermopharmaceuticals, it seems of the same value as in the cosmetics area uh, because the kinetics are nicely modeled in, in the barrier model. But uh, with a systemic application uh, in the media, uh, it is, uh, let's say, a, a, a bit poor modeling of uh, what systemically happens if a drug is uh, um, uh, entering the skin via the systemic route. Uh, EMA plans then uh, at, at the ECVAM workshop to uh, publish a, a question and answer document uh, on their website, which happened in 2011. And it uh, should be valid until the international at the international level. <coughs> and, excuse me. <coughs> the ICH S10 guideline on photo safety testing is adopted. Next slide, please. Next. Okay. Um, This is um, um, uh, just one of many, many publications of the Japanese uh, studies, pre-validation studies and formal validation studies uh, on the photo ROS assay. Um, <coughs> in this study, this is the, uh, the first publication of the, of the formal validation study. In this study, um, uh, 23 phototoxins and 90 non-phototoxins had been tested. No false negatives uh, were shown. That means whenever the ROS assay said you should do a photobiological testing because it's positive, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it was positive then in the follow-up testing, biological follow-up testing with the 3D3 or other assays. Um, uh, the um, uh, number of, um, sorry. Okay, the number of irrelevant positives, I would call it, that means positive uh, positives that have a potential, but then uh, which is not doesn't turn out in vivo. Uh, that was 20 to 40 percent less than uh, if we look at the only the molecular extinction coefficient. So it, it is probably a better trigger than the uh, MEC, and uh, it is currently mentioned in the guidance document. Because the study, the validation study is uh, finished, but it's not uh, reviewed yet, and therefore uh, maybe it will stay uh, with the text like it is currently, that it is 
probably a better trigger uh, or at least a, a, a second valuable trigger for phototoxicological testing. Next. Next. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, this is only the, um, uh, the EMA um, question and, and answer paper that sh uh, was uh, regarded as an interim so that industry would know we can uh, um, uh, we only have to test chemicals that have a MAC higher than 1000. Uh, we can uh, stop any photobiological testing if the 3D3 is negative. All these things uh, are put down in question and answers. Uh, and now we are in the situation that we have the ICHS 10 document uh, finished by the experts of the ICH. Next. 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 Please. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, this is the ICH uh, guidance document as you can download it from the EMA website currently that is uh, the uh, on the ICH website there's uh, um, the step 2 version but the, we are already in step 3 as you see on the bottom March 2013 uh, the uh, was the end of consultation and should be published the final version should be published now in end of June uh, and uh, from the committee uh, of medical products, medicinal products for human use, and uh, uh, this guidance document now considers all the points that were discussed at the FBA uh, ECBAM workshop in 2010. And uh, on the next slide, that is very busy. I've forgotten, on, unfortunately, one point that is important, but I will mention it uh, just in, in words. Next, please. Next. Okay, this is a very, very busy slide, and it it only gives. And I wanted to sh to show you on one slide original text examples from the current ICHS10, and it says uh, uh, in the first point uh, that the MEC is now increased for, uh, to thousands uh, uh, from ten to thousand. Uh, it also said that the uh, photo ROS assay uh, may be. Um, uh, a valuable trigger. It uh, also says newly that uh, a single dose tissue distribution study with animals assessed uh, at multiple time points after dosing will generally provide an adequate assessment of tissue drug levels in the potential uh, and the potential uh, for accumulation. These studies should be done quite early so that you can interpret your data, your in vitro data uh, in phototox studies much better because uh, um, uh, you know the, the levels that are reached in skin, which is the only um, uh, 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 oh, skin and eye, sorry. Skin and eye are the tissues that are exposed to light and therefore um, these um, uh, concentrations reached there uh, are relevant for interpreting your in vitro data. <laughs> it also says something which is important, metabolites are generally do not warrant uh, separate uh, photo safety evaluations because we don't know any case where metabolism uh, creates a new chromophore. So that is uh, that means uh, your your metabolism can um, change your chromophore a bit. It, it may modify a, a phototoxic potential, but it it may not generate a phototoxin. That is very important because people always say, "Oh, the 33 has no metabolic system." It is not important in phototoxicity because that is a um, uh, physical chemical um, uh, uh, property. Then sensitivity. It says, uh, however, uh, to support the integrated assessment strategy described in this document, it is most important that non-clinical photo safety assays show high sensitivity. That is, produce a low frequency of false negatives. Uh, that means. Uh, Probably a few percent would be accepted, but uh, uh, a desensitization of the 3D3 assay uh, down to 80 percent or something would not be accepted but because then 20 percent of probable phototoxins in vivo would not be tested uh, uh, adequately. 
it says also something about the 3D3 that uh, it's the most widely used assay uh, and uh, uh, <coughs> it's co uh, currently considered the most appropriate in vitro screen and then a bit later it says uh, in two paragraphs something about uh, uh, the skin models, which is a very nice text, and uh, it it says uh, a they are uh, they have an important role as a second tier. B it says if you have a, a material absorbing um, uh, only in the exclusively in the UVB, uh, you should probably uh, directly test it on the skin model because the skin models tolerate more UVB than the 3D3 cells. That's what we know. Of course, then you have to filter your, your sun simulator differently. We know a filter that we can use with the Sol 500, the, uh, the lamp that we are using for, for the 3D3, but uh, maybe other filters uh, for other equipments. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, a question that is often, and this is now a bit uh, a change from the ICH uh, guidance document, but to something that is almost every time asked by people uh, is, can UVB absorbers be detected with a 3D3? And I said, if you have an exclusively UVB absorber, then you should probably directly test it on a skin model, maybe also on the photo RBC assay, that is the red blood cell assay, because the uh, erythrocytes are also very uh, resistant to UVB. But um, the, what people do, some people do not understand is uh, if we, we are used a lamp that was uh, filtered with a cutoff of 320 nanometers, that means 320 nanometers, uh, we had a transmission of 50% still. And then it is depending on the steepness of the transmission curve of your filter, how much UVB is still present in your light. It's also uh, dependent on the irradiance above the filter, how much UVB is present on your light. So there is a little amount of UVB which is quite significant and good enough for stimulating UVB absorbers if they are not exclusively UVB. And what you see here is the a plot of the OECD recommended reference chemicals. And you see uh, that they have different absorption spectra. And the uh, important, uh, let's say for this point, important are uh, chlorobromazine and hexachlorophene. Um, they should be correctly detected positive in case of chlorobromazine, hexachlorophene negative, <coughs> and both have similar absorption spectra. If you look at the absorption spectra, both have their maximums in the UVB range. So it is not true that the that the lamp is, because we said in our publications, practically devoid of UVB that is interpreted by some people as there's no UVB in it. No, it's not true. There is UVB, but you have to limit it very strongly because um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the toxicity of the UVB light is doubling with each reduction of by 10 nanometers uh, wavelength. So if you go from 290 to 280, your toxicity of the light is doubling. And from 280 to 270, your toxicity is doubling. And that is something that is so limiting um, and, uh, also in vivo assays that people always have to filter great parts of the UVB away, and um, because it's uh, erythrothene, no, well, it's phototoxic itself. <laughs> okay, um, so that's what I wanted to show with these, um, as an example, that you shouldn't be afraid that uh, UVB absorbers cannot be tested. Yes, they can. Next slide, please. Next. Okay, this is um, my last slide. <laughs> this is uh, actually uh, um, um, one uh, representative of uh, ICWAM or NIZATAM from your country, uh, uh, Warren Casey, and I were um, uh, advisors of the management uh, in the management team of the Japanese validation study for the Photoros assay, and this was the second meeting uh, that we had in last year. Uh, and um, 
you see Warren Casey with the blue shirt and uh, and myself also with the blue shirt. Obviously, uh, all the Japanese have white shirts. And <laughs> uh, so what I wanted to say is almost 10 years after adoption of the 3D3 essay at the OECD level, we still have issues to solve. However, the essay has gained a central role in the photo safety assessment strategies and therefore all efforts are worth it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manfred. All right. So, thank you, Alison and Manfred. Um, we are a little bit over time. Um, I just wanted to hop in and let everyone know that um, if you type your questions into the question pane now, uh, even if you can't stay on the call, we will make sure that Allison and Manfred address them. Um, but we will get to a couple questions here as soon as Allison finishes up with her summary. All right. So today we spent some time discussing in vitro assays commonly used for photo safety assessments. Uh, there's a number of important considerations, including how will your test material be used? Is it an ingredient or a final formulation? How could solubility affect your testing strategy? How will you test your material be applied? Systemically, topically? What points would favor one assay over another? How can we use tier testing approaches? And importantly, how you can use these assays as part of your photo safety testing program. Both of these assays are individually unique, yet share similarity in their assessment of phototoxic potential by comparing cells or tissues exposed in the presence or absence of UVA light. An OECD test guideline for the 3T3 assay was adopted in 2004, and currently this is the only assay that's standardized and validated for photo safety. Manfred highlighted some perspectives discussed at the 2010 XAM workshop. He also talked about possible recommendations moving forward and comments on the statements recently released by the ICH. As Manfred discussed, one of the biggest concerns with this assay is its overprediction potential, especially from a pharmaceutical perspective. Yes, this assay is a sensitive assay, but it can give us a high level of confidence in our negative results. We have a number of references available. And finally, I'd like to thank everyone for your participation in today's webinar. I'd like to also thank Amanda Allery for her coordination of the webinar. And a special thank you to Manfred for his time, effort, and invaluable insights. Great. Thank you, Allison. Um, so as I said, uh, I think we'll have time to squeeze in just a couple questions here. Um, and then, just as a reminder, the rest we will still answer. Uh, we'll just do that via email. Uh, the first question is, at what stage of drug discovery should phototoxicity be tested? Manfred, do you have an insight on that one? Uh, yes, um, it's actually stated in the um, ICH guidance document, but I'm, I must admit that uh, I haven't opened it currently, and uh, uh, I think it was um, uh, phase two study, uh, before phase two, but uh, um, uh, it is, uh, I definitely know that it is stated in the ICH S10. Okay, uh, the next question is, where can I find the Phototox software for the 3T3 assay? You can, um, OECD has um, the software available for download online. Um, what we'll do is post a direct link in the uh, question and answer that we send around to everybody at the end of the webinar. Uh, next question is, will the RHE model be validated in the near future as a confirmatory tool for the 3T3 assay? Manfred, you might have a little bit more um, in terms of validation uh, efforts for that. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the point is, um, we have uh, performed an, an ECVAM pre-validation study um, uh, in uh, 98 uh, and with Procter and & Gamble and Bayersdorf. Uh, it was uh, a blinded study, um, um, very nice data, but unfortunately at that, uh, I must now s say something very private. Uh, in this year, uh, both of my parents died and uh, I was only able to publish um, a, pre uh, a validation study on uh, 
on skin corrosion, uh, which then was basis of an OECD guideline, and I was not able really to publish these data. And then, all of a sudden, it, it, uh, industry just uh, picked this essay up, and CROs picked this essay up, and uh, since they usually use it as for in-house um, um, decisions, like, uh, um, as for example, Biostuff checks all uh, um, ingredients uh, regularly uh, with the 3D3 and the skin model if the 3D3 is positive because uh, whenever you have plant uh, uh, constituents or botanical, uh, it, it may or may not be contaminated with phototoxic contaminations. Therefore, you do it batch-wise and it's an in-house decision whether you refuse the batch or uh, you use it. Uh, for uh, because of uh, phototoxic or non-phototoxic potential uh, of <coughs> uh, properties, uh, we said, well, probably we don't need an an, an OECD guideline for that uh, because it's uh, it's used for safety uh, decisions in house of companies. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I think uh, it would have been worth, but uh, for me now, for, um, uh, from a retired position, it's not very easy to stimulate um, uh, um, a, a formal validation study. And also, uh, as you may know, there's international discussions that in future we will not need uh, any kind of formal validation uh, because um, there's no validation centers anymore that really uh, provide the uh, knowledge, competence, and money uh, of uh, state-funded money for formal validation studies. They are usually done by industry now. Uh, many of them are good, uh, but uh, for these type of studies, it's not so easy to achieve regulatory acceptance then. Okay. Um, and did you, did you have anything to add about uh, the software itself, the Phototox software, Manfred? Yes, uh, the, uh, Alison said uh, you go to the uh, uh, OECD website. What I wanted to recommend to anyone who, who wanted to use the software, download please not only the software but also the validation data sets. The reason is uh, this is a this is the only validation study that I know where all the data except for one laboratory in the in the second phase uh, that was Unilever because they had handwritten uh, results results that we could not easily transfer into the software. But all the validation data uh, for all laboratories for all runs are there as PXP files. So if you install the software in your in-house environment and then you run it probably, uh, you run the essay under GLP, people will come, a GLP will, auditor will come and say, how can you show the validation in-house now? And uh, so what you then do is you just uh, um, use a data set from this validation study uh, and um, uh, which is already fitted, which is uh, downloadable there, and uh, use the, the the pure raw data and let them fit again in your environment. And if you get the same result as it is, as it is uh, in the uh, uh, OECD downloadable uh, files, then you're done. That's a question that I often got from CROs that uh, that set up this essay and then get into the first uh, GLP audit. That is one point. The second point is, please download also the um, uh, the publication of Peters and Holzhütter of the validation uh, of this uh, software, because uh, it helps you to understand why uh, why if you um, evaluate the same chemical three or four or five times, you always will get a slight different value in the third digit after the comma. It will not have an influence on your <coughs> on your prediction, but it is based on uh, on the procedure that is used. That is uh, a bootstrapping procedure, and uh, I'm I'm not talking about now. It it, ta it will take uh, too much time about this procedure, but it's uh, it's a very uh, uh, important procedure, and uh, it. Uh, uh, it turns out that each calculation newly is generated by random selection of curve uh, sample uh, of curve um, uh, uh, pairs <coughs> of irradiated and non irradiated uh, pairs that are generated from your inherited valid uh, uh, variation of your experiment that is a bit uh, mathematics behind uh, but it's 
it's really helpful to download this publication as well, read it, and it's very simply written uh, and easy to understand, and uh, it helps you to understand uh, the results that you get from the software. Thank you for adding that, Manfred. That actually uh, answered another one of the questions that we had received. So that was good information. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, uh, I'd like to thank Allison and Manfred and all of the attendees for staying with us and your participation in the webinar today. Uh, we would like to remind you that any of these questions that you've sent us that weren't answered during the Q&A time will be addressed by the presenters, and the answers will be disseminated to all of the webinar participants within a few business days, along with a copy of the slides and a link to the recording. If you'd like additional information on the assays or help determining the best strategy for testing your compound, please contact Allison directly. Uh, her email address is right here on this slide. And don't forget to visit our website, www.iivs.org, to find out the date and topic of our next webinar and other news in the field of in vitro toxicology. Thank you once again for your participation, and we hope to see you in a meeting, training, or during our next webinar. Thanks a lot.